think we're good. <laughs> is that our mic check now? That's that's how I do it now. I I've uh, already just throttle the microphone. screamed into both microphones before you got here. Now I just need to just to get them warmed up. <laughs> that's how I warm them up. I go <laughs> into each one. All right, let's do this. Welcome to the next current episode of Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts, the culture cast caught at the crossroads of curation and castration. Curtis. Benjamin. How are you? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good. I, t- this has been a, this has been a, a bit of a weird week. Yeah? Yeah. Why? Um, in order, <laughs> I, I went to New Jersey for a con. I met the you know the director from Leatherface and mm-hmm. Puppet Master Four and Five, Jeff Burr. Jeff Burr, friend of the show, friend of the show. Jeff, I know you're listening. It was nice meeting you this weekend. Met my childhood hero the very next day, Mick. I know you're listening. Thanks for listening. Uh, then I got some, I got some Wu Tang news like the next day. I'm one step closer to hearing the the lost Wu Tang because Clan it's going to be claimed by the federal government. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's Martin been, Shkreli. You he's in fucking, jail. He you fucked flew, up. You flew too close to the sun, Martin. It happens to the best of us. You know, he, he tried to play that Bond villain, but he just <laughs> wasn't up to snuff. He's getting the uh, Bond villain shit. Never ends up well for them. Yeah, I mean, even in the Bond movies, it's not even like a secret. You know, it just yeah. doesn't end well. And uh, word is coming in from the IRS now that they are chasing Martin Shkreli on a snowmobile. He is he has the album under his arm. He's running away through the woods, <laughs> ski resort. They've got our best resort style. They've got their best agent on the case. Yeah, he's gonna snap the skis off a snowmobile and snowboard down a mountain. <laughs> that happens in some James Bond movies. Let's do the James Bond series. That's a long series. Yeah, and I hate all of them. You don't like James Bond? No, I don't. Also, there's already a better podcast that has that just talks about James Bond. Is it James Bonding? I think so. I'm not sure. My wife listened to it a lot oh. for a while. It's really good. I've never listened to James Bonding, but I've heard good things. Yeah. Uh, but with all those things that happened this week, that was not the weirdest or most unusual thing that happened to me this okay. week. Last night, I watched a really good David Lynch movie. Oh, shit. Yeah. Blue Once, Velvet? You finally yeah, rewatched it? I, I watched Blue Velvet again. <laughs> I get it now. Any, I was on the fence. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm into it. What did you watch last night? I watched the movie we'll be talking about today, Lost Highway. Lost Highway. Before we do that, though, how All are right. you? It's not only it's not fair. If I only get to do my half. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm good. The kids doing good. Excellent. Uh, I'm back at work now. Excellent. Yeah, uh, but you know, you just you 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 spend all day at work thinking about your baby. Yeah. Then you get home and you see your baby, and it's just <laughs> oh, it's just great. Baby's stoked to see you. Baby's usually puzzled to see me. Actually, like her <laughs> eyebrows get kind of furrowed. She like looks at me like, "What are you? What are you doing here? You think you can just come and you go? You just come and go as Dad. you please, <laughs> Papa." <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Stella, I'm still stellar week for the both of us. <laughs> still, still, still rolling along. Still rolling right along. Yeah. We're uh, something about Wednesdays. We are. We're again a race against time before another snow apocalypse. Yeah, as we staring down, today. staring down a snow day tomorrow. Yeah, I can see the flakes coming down now as I look out. It's supposed to be like whiteout conditions tomorrow morning too. It's supposed to be pretty awful. Yeah, like three inches an hour. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. I'm gonna go get lost out there. And if I'm lucky, <laughs> never find my way back. You have some real. You can have some real good adventures during a snow apocalypse, man. Yeah. The sound gets dampened. It does. Yeah, it's, I love that effect. Uh, the last major storm we had, I was out shoveling, and then I, I looked around myself, and there were lights on, but there was there was no cars, no <laughs> people, silent and dark, yeah. and just, I felt like the only person alive at that moment, and it was pretty all right. I think yep. I'd do okay in a situation like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, Lost Highway. All right, Lost Highway. 
I what, what happens in this movie? <laughs> man, that's a good fucking <laughs> that's question. That's the worst question to ask about Lost Highway. Yeah, apparently. Um I, I Are we going to go over the synopsis? Do we do, uh, do, we do there's that? There's a there's a man played by Bill Pullman who may or may not have killed his wife and then there's <laughs> another man who Bill Pullman turns into and there's it's all very psychological, yeah. all very surreal. Um first thing about this movie Bill Pullman is I I was very attracted to Bill Pullman in this movie. Pretty sure I had only seen him in the movie Casper, where he's kind of got the dad bod. He's a much mm. gentler, softer person. He was a good looking man in this movie. Dude, him playing that saxophone, you know that I wasn't sure I could get on board with the sax. <laughs> it's really hard to fake playing an instrument you don't know how to play. Huh. I think all things considered, he did a pretty good. You job. You think he was faking that? Probably faking that, really? yeah. I don't know. That looked pretty credible to me. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I don't play the saxophone either. Yeah. So, I maybe, don't know. Maybe he really was playing it. Maybe. Maybe he's just going nuts. But you're, you're right. There's an animal energy to him in yeah, this movie. Yeah, he's got the he's got the old kind of what I call the Kurt Russell, the tight black Ooh. jeans with the, the tight black t-shirt that just magically meets the top of the jeans and mm-hmm. stays there, mm-hmm. never rides up high. The hair? Yeah. It looks like it's it's just flat. He's got like leather yeah. for hair. Nice looking guy in that yeah. movie. That was one of, that was the first thing that I noticed. Because the movie well, it doesn't open on a shot of him. It opens on that shot of the highway, right? Mm-hmm. Speeding along along the center line on the highway. But the first non sort of overture shot of the movie is that shot of his face as he smokes a cigarette, right? And it just illuminates his face yep. and darkens. Which uh that kind of leads me to into one of the things that I thought was great about this movie was we with Eraserhead we talked about the the contrast of the black and the white and the imagery in the film and then Blue Velvet felt really special because we got to see those same things with color Mm -hmm. this movie the the lighting choices in this movie were really fantastic Mm -hmm. it was any shadow was complete pitch black you have no idea what you're looking at especially in that house at the beginning yeah yeah and all all the light had this very it was like like a like da vinci light like mm. it was every it was very baroque every or, uh, light bulb had this like visible aura of light yeah. around it that yeah. really made it seem like it was just very saturated and very interesting to look at yeah um yeah so it was a weird movie it is weird, but it's not. It it holds you at a little bit of a distance, I guess. It's not a movie with any easy answers, either about like the plot or about what any of it means. <laughs> yeah. But you, uh, what did you walk away from this movie thinking? I walked, I walked away from this movie thinking that it was a good movie because <laughs> I think. I th- I've been thinking about this at work today, so I, I maybe haven't worked through the whole thought process yet. I don't, I don't think anybody has worked through the whole thought process about Lost Highway. I, I asked myself, what is the point of a movie? I think it's to, to entertain, but I think when it boils down to it, the point of a movie is to tell a story. Mm-hmm. Because when you see a movie, someone will say, Hey, I saw this movie, and then if you're whoever you say that to, says, "Oh, nice, was it good?" And you say, "Yeah, it was about this." Mm-hmm. That's the first thing you say. They put it on the box. Nobody asks you, "Oh, you saw Lost Highway? What were some stunning visuals in that movie?" <laughs> that's that's all secondary. A movie is a story. So, any movie that tells a story, you have to acknowledge that it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> A good a put that on the box yeah. for Lost Highway. A good a good movie is a story that makes you think, and a great movie is a movie that makes you think differently after you've seen it for the rest of your life that you didn't think before. Mm-hmm. And I thought there was some really cool stuff going on in Lost Highway that there were some. I don't know. Maybe this isn't like the best example but the, the thing that i thought when i was watching it was there are some sixth sense levels of what the fuck is going on here this doesn't make any sense why is this happening but you don't get any of the answers that sixth sense gives you <laughs> i kept waiting for this big like revelation at the end of like oh man holy shit no you mm. just they just nope. 
<laughs> but you know, I you know, so what? It's it's not a it's not an amazing movie, but for two and a half hours, it made me think. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that's gonna mean. <laughs> mm. I never got any answers, but it still kept me going. It still is a movie. It's still technically a movie. Yes. Hey, you know what I uh, the the best thing that I read was uh, the best thing I read about Lost Highway was on the AV Club. It was part of their new cult canon series. Scott Tobias, I think, is the writer uh, who who did this write up about Lost Highway, as which has gained kind of cult status afterwards. And and what he points out is he compares Lost Highway to like the OJ footage, this uh, and and the subsequent happenings with OJ Simpson in the years since he definitely committed that crime, <laughs> right? Which is like he seems to have bifurcated his brain effectively into the the persona that he has in the world did not commit that crime of course i didn't do it right i'm so confident that i didn't do it that i will put out a book called if i did it (laughs) that is just a fictional recounting of the way that i would have committed the crime that i definitely didn't commit can i tell you something interesting about that yeah uh just yesterday i watched a watch mojo video about the top 10 i hate watch mojo but it's okay i watch it every day still patronize them yeah i i uh, it was the top 10 times that TV predicted the future. And before, oh, I mean, it probably happened because of this, but on the Chris Rock show, uh, there was a joke about Chris Rock was showing like a tour of backstage and he had a, vi- he had a VHS tape with OJ's face on it. And it said that the title of the tape was, I didn't do it, but if I did, this is how I would do it. And I, then shortly after I, the, the book actually yeah. happened where if i did it <laughs> if i did it yeah <laughs> so that was weird yeah but continue i'm sorry that well was... no it's all good that that's essentially that was kind of the key to make, helping me understand that movie because where lost highway ends is on fred bill pullman's character in his car driving having a psychotic breakdown right like camp fast cuts all over the place it looks like a nine inch nails video so he's having a seizure He's a, yeah, it looks it looks like a seizure, but he is seized, right? He is seized by uh, by a power that has complete control over him in that moment. He can't. He he. Here's what I think happened in Lost Highway. All right, hit me. Fred kills his girlfriend Renee because he feels jealous and feels like she's pulling away from him, and he he's just stressed out, right? So he kills her. But then after he goes to prison, he's in complete denial about having killed his girlfriend, which is the first thing he says to the cops when they're talking to him. He was like, tell me I didn't kill my girlfriend. So while he's in jail, he dis- he disassociates into this other personality, Pete, and then he fantasizes about Pete. I'm not Fred, I'm Pete, right? Mm-hmm. Pete would never do anything like that. So he just watches Pete's life. He watches this story. I, essentially, I think that the second half of Lost Highway is a story that Fred is telling himself to convince himself that there is a version of his life in the world that does not end with him killing somebody. <laughs> On death row. Right? Doesn't end with him pursued by the police. But what he finds is that it's, I mean, it's kind of a dark message, but like, there's no changing, Fred. Yeah. You are who you are. You are a murderer. Or it's a... Well, what's the what's the, the oldest story we have about murder, right? It's Cain and Abel. And what happens to Cain after... Sorry to bring up Bible stuff all the time on this show, everybody. <laughs> sorry. I know that's, like, becoming my fucking thing, but... Has anyone called you out on that? No. Uh, no, they haven't. Oh, I didn't know if it was, like, a self-realization or... No, this is, this is just me realizing that I talk about this constantly. <laughs> um, Someone's gonna... I don't have it in my repertoire, so... <laughs> It's good that we're, you know, it's good that we have it. Yeah, we've got we've got it all covered. Uh, Cain and Abel. After Cain kills Abel, God says to Cain, "You, the earth is cursed. The, the earth, Cain, Abel's blood is crying out to me from the land. And Cain, you are cursed now. So the, I think the the message there is like there's no coming back from murder. Once you have murdered someone, you have separated yourself from the rest of humanity by committing that horrible act. Uh, and that definitely seems to be what happens to Fred. No matter what story he tells himself about what happened, he's always going to be that person. It's probably the same with OJ right now, you know? Yeah. Like, OJ's just living his life, but he can never live a normal life because he is a murderer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? So whether whether or not he whether or not justice was meted out upon OJ, cosmic justice is 
going to be meted out because OJ has to live with being the murderer that he is. OJ, I know you're listening. Reach out. <laughs> uh, OJ, these are Ben's opinions. I, <laughs> I nothing. I don't. Uh, Kurt's still holding out for that OJ guest spot. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm holding out for that. I don't think he did it only because I don't want to die. I <laughs> no, I don't even. The only thing I know about OJ is that everybody says he did it. I don't know anything about it. Uh, all of my, all the things I just said are were said for fiction. Or were not meant to be slander <laughs> or libel. Uh, none of this is meant to be taken seriously. This is all just for entertainment. Yeah. More importantly, juice. Don't be bothered by the weird things that Ben says. He, <laughs> he's, he's, a guy. he's all this fucking yeah. Bible talk. He's <laughs> there's something weird going on with that guy. Yeah. Okay, that's my read on Lost Highway, though. No, right? that's and, good. and at the end, you see him in absolute torment. Once yeah. you, once Fred has murdered, once he has realized that he is a murderer, there is no path for him that doesn't lead to hell. Yeah. And at the in the final shots of that movie, we see a, 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 an excellent cinematic depiction of a man in hell. Maybe we see uh, we see Bill Pullman waking himself up from this dream after realizing that no matter what life he lives, he gets you know chased down. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm glad you I'm glad you said that because I I had taken a a much different meaning in that David Lynch will come up with like a cool idea and then make a movie before he really knows what to do with that idea. <laughs> that's really all that I was able to pull from it. So mm. that's actually a cooler way to think about it. So What did you think the idea was? I think he just wanted to do I don't know I don't even know if I know what that idea was but I think that he that seems to every time I I read it and I don't remember I was reading about Lost Highway and it was the same thing with Blue Velvet and Eraserhead where he said well I had a dream or whatever or an idea about a guy's head falling off and then them making it into erasers and then that's <laughs> somehow the fucking plot to eraser head mm-hmm. and then with blue velvet it was i had a you know idea about a guy watching someone change while hiding in a closet mm-hmm. and then witnessing a crime yeah that's one source for it and i've also i think i also read somewhere that he he very early on got the idea of walking through a field and finding an yeah ear. and that was that that too and that's those why are maybe the two wellsprings that came together I to think make with, blue velvet I think that is kind of, which now I don't remember what the, unfortunately, the, the idea behind Lost Highway, but I, th- I recalled it being something similar to like, well, I had this idea, so, and like this idea, so we just like smash them together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I don't know. I We made an art out of yeah, it. <laughs> we, we made one unit, one consumable yep. unit of art. We worked together to make this art after we... <laughs> Both, it was co-written. This one with Barry Gifford. Yeah, you know and who they Barry both, Gifford is. I don't. He's the guy who wrote the novel that Wild at Heart was based on. Oh, so okay. they, you've got two. So they're just buddies now. They're just pals. You've got two David Lynch Barry Gifford uh, collaborations mashed up right next to each other in uh, in the David yeah. Lynch filmography. And I, I had read that they both where they wanted to make a movie together, so they both started coming up with ideas. Oh, and neither of them liked. Their, each other's ideas or like really f- were in love with any of their own ideas sounds a lot like us Curtis yeah so I mean I think it just kind of you know lost highways the Ben and Kurt till it hurts of... <laughs> <laughs> and then, well we gotta do something Christ <laughs> just we'll talk about whatever literally anything <laughs> As I love if, all your ideas, Curtis. I'm, not, I'm joking. Is, I'm joking. No, no, as this as is if, as much a joke as the OJ Simpson thing. As if media isn't wide enough of a scope, half the time we start talking about politics or or it's really we're, morals. We uh religion. we we walk a fine line, right? Which is we we try to walk this ridge line, and we inevitably end up falling to one side or the other. And on one side is ethics, politics, religion. The, the the situation of the modern man and on the other side is Resident Evil 4 and we always end up falling into a, one of those two pits yeah boy do I love the Resident Evil 4 pit dude I could I would like to see kind of a mashup of Lost Highway and Resident Evil 4 <laughs> where Leon S. Kennedy is like he's always trying to seek Ashley but really what he's trying to do is atone for having done something horrible I'll tell know. you 
I think you just need to play Resident Evil 6. Really? Like, uh, a bunch of bad ideas all slammed together into one incoherent story. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, that's Resident Evil 6. Video Bad video game stories are never as good as bad movie stories, I find. Yeah, uh, you're right. Something about... It's because you have to play the garbage in between. <laughs> it, like, it makes me really bitter and angry. Yeah. Man, video games are weird. It, yeah. It's, it's strange because... Media is just weird now, you know? I, is it? I, well, I mean, it probably always has been, but, like, video games are especially weird. I saw a noisy article today. Didn't read it, but it was a, a screenshot. The, the the thumbnail was, like, a screenshot from a Tony Hawk game, mm-hmm. and it was, like, I have found out of my favorite music all throughout video games my whole life or whatever. And that's what's weird about games is that like a video game is its own thing and a movie is its own thing and then music is its own thing but video games they weirdly especially in this day and age they like bring together music movie and game hmm. where they in a, in a weird way and a lot of times the game part seems to fall flat but then it makes all of it fall flat because like you know if the the idea is not fleshed out enough hmm. to be a movie i don't know yeah but anyway, I, I would say that uh, a video game is mostly a video game is mostly game, but it has like a layer of music and a layer of cinematic narrative story applied to it for ease of digestion. Those are like the little spoonfuls of sugar that help you stay engaged in the game even when the game is boring, right? Like why did why did video games ever have stories in the first place? It's not you don't need a most original most most games throughout human history have not had stories because games are themselves story generation devices, right? You make a, you make a game or a sport, right? Like that ancient Mesoamerican sport where you can only touch the ball with your hips and your shoulders or something, (laughs) right? Yeah. You make some pretty crazy ass stories (laughs) when you put a limit like that. It's like then he, so here's the thing, the ball was coming at him and then he hit it with his hip, then his shoulder, then his hip again. And it went into the hoop. Right, that's a cool story. Um, not, I don't know. What am I? What am I talking about? Man, I guess what I'm saying is that stories are inessential. Stories were always an artificial layer put on top of a video game to kind of disguise it as something else. When really all a video game is is a weird physical test that you give yourself, or a, a, a contest that you place between two people. Ben, what the fuck is it that you even find fun about video games? It sounds like you don't have fun. <laughs> I guess none I of this sounds fun. I guess I don't like video <laughs> games. Um, <laughs> I like, I don't know. Do I like video games? You tell me. <laughs> All right, here we're bringing back uh, Ben's random video game knowledge. Good. Uh, give me two or three, however many you can think of, handful, best Stories in video games. Best stories Best in video plot games. plot for a video game. For, All right. As compared to, like, a great movie. You can't compare those things, I don't think. Yeah. Like, the best stories in video games for me are, like, Half-Life. Because yeah. Half-Life has the perfect amount of story to kind of string together these well-designed arenas where you fight a variety of interesting enemies with a variety of yeah. interesting weapons. Or the other best stories in video games are, like, the time I got into the top ten in PUBG... <laughs> you know, like I fucking I I snuck around. I did my best because in PUBG, the thing I've realized, Player Unknown Battlegrounds. For anybody who doesn't know, it's a game where it's just battle battle royale style game. Everyone's dropped on an island and you all fight each other till there's only one person left. Start with a hundred, you end up with that one. Sounds like that really good name game Fortnite. It's a little bit like Fortnite, I've heard. Except Fortnite is for babies. I was, I was literally just trying to trigger you with, <laughs> with that. I'd like to get into Fortnite. I hear they do some good stuff. It's like there's a little bit of a Minecraft element to it. You build yeah. as well. I don't know. Build it sounds some, build some defense. It sounds kind of neat, but like I don't need to go into my fucking PUBG story. It was tight though. I tried not to fight anybody. I tried to hide from people. So instead of being an action game, it was a stealth game. Right. And playing that stealth game where all the guards were real people in a wide open island, I managed to survive for 40 minutes by the fucking skin of my teeth <laughs> until I made a really bad decision, walked into a stupid room and got killed by a guy who was hiding in the corner, right? Uh so that's a pretty good story for me. Yeah. So I mean, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Um, of, like, I think Final Fantasy VII has a really good story, yeah. also like a really good plot. Um, Final Fantasy VII's writing is really good for like an anime, which 
anime is good. I couldn't tell you if it is or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think... I don't know. I think... Uh, I think The Last of Us had a really good story. I hear that a lot. It was written by a novelist? Yeah. yeah. I, th- I think that video games have good st- have stories that are as good as good comic books. Because most of the time the story also isn't really the point in a comic book. It's about it's as much about image as it is about plot in many cases. If you want a good plot, go read a novel. Right? Words on a page. That's how we do plot. If you want to see really cool images that are mashed up with a plot and some cool characters and some interesting, like, wild sci-fi ideas, then a comic book or a video game might be your speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, for you listeners out there, if you don't want to be a nerd that reads books, <laughs> follow me and I'll tell you some comic books where they've got some plot. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't read a book in years. <laughs> Look at me now. I read too many books. I spend too much time reading books. Books are great. I love books. They are. You know what else I love? What? Lost Highway. Yeah, we can get, we can we can go back. We can get back to Lost Highway. We can, we can pull back. All right. right. Um, some things that I like about Lost Highway. Lost Highway really brought me back to the nineties. Yeah. Right. Because of all the Marilyn yeah. Manson, Trent Reznor, yeah, Nine oh Inch my Nails God. stuff. The fucking Rammstein soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been able to get into Rammstein. Really? So I was kind of into Rom. That was hard. For Rammstein. Me. Yeah. In my day. I, I believe that. That seems like... When it was appropriate to be in the Rammstein. I, you know, right? I, I don't know. 18 it. years old, you're disaffected. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of me being anything other than fucking sunshine, than cloudy. 27-year-old Ben. I can't picture you older or younger than you are now. Damn, you're freestyling it with freestyling. that microphone now? Hold, holding the mic now. <laughs> Uh, but also, like, Marilyn Manson stars in a porno in this movie. Yeah. It's really creepy. It was funny. Which it's supposed to be. This may be David Lynch's... Okay, up, up here's... I'm going to make more broad statements about David Lynch's whole filmography. David Lynch, up until this point, has been engaging, with the exception of Eraserhead and Elephant Man and Dune, so really just two movies. Uh, Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart are both erotic movies. They're very intrigued by the idea of erotica. This movie is about pornography more than anything else, which there's a difference, right? Can you explain the difference? The difference between erotica and pornography? Yes, please. Uh, I think, huh, I don't know. That's a good question. What do you think the difference is? Uh, do you think there is a difference? I, I, maybe, but I, I lump them, these three movies, right into the same. Mm. It's just lust. That's just, <laughs> all these movies are just people... You know what this movie really offered? This movie made me realize that uh, I there was a lot of thrusting in this movie. I had not. I'm 28 years old. I've watched a shitload of movies in those 28 years. I've seen a lot of sex scenes in movies. I had, did not realize until last night that every single one of those scenes did not have thrusting <laughs> until I watched Lost Highway. And I was like, wow, these really they're really. That's a scene. They're acting right now. That's not pretend. That's. <laughs> I didn't know that I had not seen I do that. think it was pretend. Oh, I yeah. But I wasn't... mean, you know, I don't know. We're not talking about the blue bunny here. No. We're talking about blue velvet. <laughs> We're talking about Lost Highway. We're about the thrusting in Lost Highway. There's, the not the, things... as, as, there's not that many sex scenes in this movie. Compared to Blue Velvet and Wild, especially Wild at Heart, which is just suffused with sex beginning to end. Anyway, you were saying... You tally. One... <laughs> uh, yes. I had the the privilege. It was a cool way to experience uh, Lost Highway because I watched Wild at Heart. I think I mentioned I watched it with my wife. I did mention that because I kept having to be like, I've never seen this. I yeah. didn't know this was going to happen. Yeah. I'm not weird for making you watch this. Yeah. Yes, um, you are. Yeah, well, she knows I'm weird. She's very polite. You were trying to defend yourself. Yeah. And so I was watching this, and she wasn't home when I started it. And she came home about maybe like a half hour into the movie. Oh, wow. And she was like, she's like, what's going on? And I was like, well, this guy is, he plays the saxophone, and he left his wife at the house one night while he played, and then he came back, and when they woke up, there was a VHS tape on their doorstep, and uh, it showed like a clip outside their house, 
And now every day when they wake up, there's a, another VHS tape that shows the same footage but longer. And it's gone as far as to go into their house and uh, show them sleeping. And now they think there's somebody in the house. And as I was telling that, I was like, in my head, like, this movie's fucking awesome. Like, that's, that's, this is thrilling. <laughs> like, I'm, all of a sudden I realized I was really enjoying the movie. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, as I, I just kind of, it kept me going through the whole movie. I was, what's going to happen next? Why is this happening? What does this mean? And unfortunately, it didn't really give me a lot of concrete answers at the end of it. There are no answers to be had. So, I don't know. But I, you know, I don't know. It changes so much in that moment. When he turns into Pete, it really becomes a different movie. Yeah. To, you know, it's but hard. But then, then little elements of the first part of the movie keep creeping in. It's, it's yeah. like he can't, he creates this little walled garden in his mind trying to keep out the bad stuff. But because the bad stuff is inside of him, he cannot keep out the bad part of himself. And, uh, you know, as you're, as you're watching this, you don't know... You know, after a while, you're just like, I guess he's our main character now. Like, yeah, <laughs> where's Little Pete? Where's Bill Pullman? Pete Dayton. Who knows? Um, but I thought it was it's uh, it's very challenging to make a movie where your main character changes halfway through it, and without I'm you know you have this like speculation about what it it might be, but at least when you're watching the movie, for all you know the second character is a completely different character and you're wondering how do you get in there like mm -hmm. when you know when's the other guy going to come back what happened to that guy and uh but i think this movie was very effective at it's hard for you to get invested in a character and then have the story go never mind don't don't you know he's either dead or don't worry about that this is your guy now it's hard to keep that on board and this is one of the like the few times that i was really like all right cool this guy now like mm -hmm. if we figure it out we figure it out if not <laughs> you know i like this guy just as much as bill pullman we're just on this crazy journey together yeah i think like psycho is probably the only other one i can think of immediately mm. that switches main characters on you and it's just like yeah this is still sick yeah red state fails gloriously yeah. at doing that <laughs> Yeah, fuck Red State. That movie's all right. Ben? <laughs> it's probably, it's one of the best Kevin Smith movies. I will fucking leave. <laughs> I will call the cops. <laughs> <back. laughs> Fight me on that one. Oh, we're going to have to do the Kevin Smith series. We're going to... We're gonna... I, dr I wake up in a cold sweat <laughs> thinking about having to do the Kevin Smith series on this podcast. Especially, you know, what if we have to, we're going to have to rewatch Clerks and Mall Rats too. No. No, but, I refuse. Just re-upload that episode. But we can't just re-upload re it because I'm We've... doing all kinds of crazy mic stuff today. I don't know <laughs> if this is going to sound weird. You know, we're we're on a journey of our own, Ben. This yeah. whole B and C till it H thing, this place is it's going crazy places, making crazy stops. We're different people than we were the first time we watched those movies. We are different people. We've I think even on the podcast recanted a little bit and like, I think that was a little bit too hard yeah. on Mall Rats. Yeah. Uh in fact it was the the little documentary you showed me that made yeah. me kind of turn around on H Bomber it. guy's video about uh about VHS tapes. Yeah. You know, yeah. I need to have less expectations. I think that's what it is because that's that's what does it for me. I purposefully don't read about any of these David Lynch movies or any movie before I see it because I don't want to have any expectations or knowledge of it. But then I still go into a movie thinking it's going to be something and, you know, being disappointed. Sometimes a movie isn't anything. I had completely I had I had pegged David Lynch completely wrong. I'm yeah. not like I haven't loved his movies, but his movies haven't been anything that I thought they were going to be either. So Me either, to be honest. Yeah, you know, so it's tough. You know, I I wonder I feel differently now about, you know, I'm, I'm eased up on some of the Kevin Smith movies a little bit, except Red State. Fuck Red State. Red State's good. Um, so maybe the same thing will happen with David Lynch, but right now I'm looking at a sea of okay movies. But <laughs> You're looking the, at two more okay movies. The law of averages makes them okay. The Realistically, two of them are very good, mm -hmm. and then the rest of them I just don't think are really here's, good. Here's the thing I keep hearing, though. I... Th I believe that Mulholland Drive is going to be a turnaround moment for you. I hope because so. Because you know, you know who else didn't like any of these David Lynch movies other than Eraserhead? Who? 
the little guy I like to call Roger Ebert. <laughs> okay. Right? He hasn't liked any of them so far. He thinks they're exploitative and mediocre. You know, but I, right? I don't want to go pull back away, and read though, the reviews. That I, I, I did really like, I did really like Lost Highway. Yeah. Lost Highway was like when you go out to eat and then you get like a really good drink and an appetizer and a main meal. Love these food analogies. And the, I'm all food. That's all <laughs> I got. And then, you know, you go to get dessert and they like, you know, your dessert has like gone bad, but they didn't know. You're you know? saying that, okay, in, within this food analogy, you're saying that a movie presents a mystery and then the answers to that mystery are like the dessert after the meal. Specifically with Lost Highway, it's just... I kept sitting down through the course of this movie, and I would kept being impressed with how it was being served to me and how mm-hmm. how good how it was. How well cooked this movie was. And then, but then, it just at the very end, that I was waiting for. I had expectations. You know, I I thought I was going to get answers to all these questions, and I didn't get any. In the same way that I thought I was going to get a killer piece of pie to go with all these delicious drinks and meals that I've had and then it wasn't good at the end and then you yeah. leave kind of being like mm, all I can taste is that old pie that it wasn't supposed to be wouldn't eaten. that be a great if 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 food if meals were like movies then I think it would be a really good artistic choice to serve someone some rotten disgusting pie <laughs> at the end of a meal is like a is like a statement piece it's like sometimes <laughs> things don't come out how you want them to sometimes life disappoints you all right wait so if <laughs> Sorry. If movies if movies are like food, uh-huh. then what is the cinematic equivalent of the poop you take after you eat a meal? Because that's part of the food experience as well. Okay. Um this is uh it, the answer is this podcast. Yeah, the, when yeah, I honestly <laughs> The answer yeah. is when you podcast. When about you're it. when you are listening to a podcast about the movie you watched from two non-professionals that don't really have any authority <laughs> in the matter. <laughs> that that Who are you calling a non-professional over that's, here, Curtis? That's you know, I I use professional only in the strictest sense that <laughs> viewing movies does not pay our bills. Oh, so, yeah. not to say that we are amateurs, mm-hmm. but we're certainly we don't get that Inland Empire I money. I haven't done a podcast for almost a year <laughs> just to be called a non-professional. That's true. <laughs> I hate how I'm holding this. But it's <laughs> like, really what fucking... the fuck are you doing? I don't even know. Curtis has the, has the microphone on a tripod, right? Usually he yeah. uses the tripod as it's as intended. As a tripod? Use. He holds it. But now he actually is holding the tripod closed. It's useless as a tripod right It's now. just like an extended microphone at this has point. Has Lost Highway done this to you? I'm different now, and I can't say it was just Lost Highway. Maybe it's the the Lynch movies just working over time, (laughs) but I'm definitely different now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's, we kind of went off on the food thing, but that's kind of how I feel. I really liked it. it. It was thrilling. It was great performances by everybody. That was a fucking... I just did. It just didn't end how I wanted. I okay, really. It's not. It's not like a. It's not like a bad answer was proposed to the whatever central mystery there may have been. It's just that there was no answer. So wouldn't it be more accurate to the analogy to say that it was just a meal with no dessert? What like maybe you were. If as if there were a type of meal that typically comes with dessert. Mm-hmm. But then this particular chef decided not to include the dessert course, but also not to tell you that there was not going to be a dessert course, just to kind of leave you hanging. Wouldn't that be more accurate to the food analogy? No, it feels... I love it, analogies, it, by the way, Curtis. It feels more like uh, I've signed up for an all-inclusive dinner, and then right before you know the dessert comes, they're like, hey, you know what, I'm sorry, we don't have any left. Not like we've boldly <laughs> chosen not out. to give you any. We don't have those answers that we told you we were going to give you. Did the movie? Sig- so you're saying that by by virtue of being a mystery, the movie owes you answers. By being a story, it you. Are, I, I feel like you're. It, it implies that you're going to be given an answer to the the questions that you ask. That's what movie that's that's what mystery movies do. Yes. They make you say what's happening? Why is this happening? What's going on? And then there's supposed to be a oh my god, that's what's going on. Mm-hmm. That's that's what mysteries are. 
And I think, you know, classic David Lynch to just give you the first half of that, then <laughs> can leave you dry. But he doesn't just leave you dry because the last the last moment of the movie, you you see how this character is going to end up. You know what it is? It's the Sopranos ending. Um, it, it's the Sopranos ending. It's the perfect. This Lost most, Highway has the Sopranos ending. One of the most controversial and unhappy endings. And... Yes, but also one of the greatest <laughs> because it's brave. It's so brave that it says no. You the the answer that you think you want is not what this show was about. We're going to show you the answer that the it, it's a it's a moment where the answer that you get at the end of the movie recontextualizes the rest of the movie. It, it tells you, okay, you thought you were watching a movie about about the the plot, right? But actually mm-hmm. what you were watching was a movie about the mental state of this individual. And in the final frames of the movie, by choosing not to give you any easy answers about the plot, but to actually resolve the mental state that Fred ends the movie in, that state of psychosis, the movie signals to you, Lost Highway signals to you, that okay, the the movie that you were watching was actually a different movie. It it was not a movie about the plot so much as it was a movie about this psychological journey that Fred takes himself on. You don't buy it. <laughs> I don't. The way I see that, I think those. I think that ending is an ending that you attributed to the movie because even your brain wants the movie to have an ending when David Lynch didn't even give you that. The it's, movie has an ending. I mean, it literally ends. Yeah, but... it literally does. We're not watching it right now. <laughs> We're not, it's not still on in the background. <laughs> I think that, uh, I think, honestly, I think that's kind of what that feels like, is that, you, you know, you you want an ending, so you create one, you know, with what you've been given when you haven't been given the ending, which doesn't work for me. I like it. <laughs> I think this movie ends really well. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I liked it. It's the first will I ever watch it again? Probably not in the the unless it's in the context of I think I'll watch every David Lynch movie again. Mm-hmm. Probably, <laughs> probably probably not. I don't think I'm going to do my yearly my yearly Tarantino run. Yeah. I don't think I'll do my yearly David Lynch run. Yeah. But I don't know. What are some other things I really liked about this movie? Well, let me see. The Mystery Man. Yeah, that was pretty. Yeah. Pretty the, gross. What's his Robert Blake? Yeah. Wearing like kabuki makeup. Yeah. Walks into the party and all the sound goes away. Yeah, that all was the, like, really background cool. Background noise. The, the music goes away. fades out. Yeah, yeah, and like all the all the chatter. Yeah. Of the people, it's a spooky moment, uh, and I can't think of many other movies doing that. But it's such a good idea, you know. It's such an original idea. Um, and that conversation that they have that like we've met we we met at your house in fact I'm at your house right now <laughs> call me it gets, gets, gets very serious in that yeah. moment yeah you know I had some uh, a lot of uh, you know everything in my life goes back to Fallout New Vegas but mm. I I kept thinking about you know the the, the other courier when I was watching this, because we how this starts is that, you know, you have these tapes that get sent to your house, and then he, you know, another thing was when the, the mystery man gives him the phone. I wonder if these same things would have happened if our, if our main character didn't watch the tapes, didn't didn't you know if he said fuck you guy and didn't call his house you know i think it's just as easy to think that this guy may have just been a drunk dick you know and just i, I think about it's fucking weird be like fuck off leave me alone <laughs> would he still have you know killed his uh killed his girlfriend or wife i guess well that's a big question right what because because robert blake's mystery man character says you invited me in yeah. i don't go places i'm not invited so you have to wonder what is the moment at which there we go forty six minutes and what even is free will <laughs> Ben and Kurt till it hurts <laughs> ethical moral <laughs> we've hit it all transcendental dilemmas what's your favorite level in Resident Evil four <laughs> obviously mm-hmm. it's uh when you're uh stuck in the house with 
Lewis. Okay, in that's your... a that's a good choice. That's yeah. a good choice. I like the uh, the part in the castle where you have the three different rooms that you go in, and there's like the lava room. Yep. I like the lava room a lot. The lava room is great. I think the lava room is like a weird. It's that that level does not belong in a realistic video game. No, it right? doesn't. It's a it's kind of a nod that Resident Evil take takes towards Contra yeah. or something. And it's even. That's one of the things that gets kind of crazy about that game is that the further you go into that game, the less and less likely it seems that this place could exist <laughs> in a real place. Yeah. And the thing about the lava room that's so interesting is that space is something that's very interesting in video games. Oh, it's all space. Yeah, yeah. Level design. I love because this architecture. When I think think about, okay, you have... You have any video game you walk through you walk through a door is the room on the other side of that door in any way shape or form actually connected to the room you were just in or is it uh, you know is that piece of memory stored in a completely different part of the game or disc or does anything you know if you turned on glitches so you could clip through walls would you be in that room mm. if you, you know, didn't activate door, if you just clipped through the door? I think about that a lot. Yeah. And I think with Resin- with that particular room in Resident Evil 4, it feels there's like a cutscene that <laughs> takes you to it yeah. as you ride the big stupid wheelchair thing. Yep. I don't even know what that thing is. Yeah, I think it's like a mine cart. Yeah. Like fucking Donkey Kong Country. <laughs> you gotta jump over gaps. There's there's the one that has like gigantic like cog wheels yeah. that moves down a track and uh, and then you get to that room and it's like this is not connected to the area that I just was mm-hmm. and it, then you do it and you come back and it it feels like Leon was in a very different place. That's a very weird part of that game. It is. It is. Now, what to what you were saying before, though, because that the the dilemma that you're proposing there is like, is the room that you go into really attached to the room prior? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that the answer is more yes than no. I think even if the memory, even if you were to no clip out, even if you were to cheat the logic of the game to be able to fly to places you're not supposed to, to look at the level as a whole and see that the game only loads one room at a time. I think that by virtue of having been designed as a space where they are connected by that door, I do think that it is more true to say that they are truly connected than to say that they aren't. Because all the, all the logic of the game is doing all the like loading into memory and letting you move through the spaces. All that's doing is representing an abstract designed space through the logic of the video game. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like the space exists outside of the video game already, and the game is just representing it to you through the tubes of the screen. Welcome to our podcast, everybody. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to this. Not the best. If you've never listened to B and C till the before. Try a couple before. different. Listen to the Tarantino series. Yeah. Right. Go then, you know. Don't start from the beginning. Yeah. Jump Unless in you at really Tarantino like Resident Evil 4. When you get and if you really like Resident Evil 4, don't because yeah. we're probably going to talk about it again and we'll be we're better at this now. So Yeah. But you know what it uh you know what it makes me think of this whole talk that we're having is the video game The Beginner's Guide mm-hmm. made by uh a video game artist named Davy Reedon, I think, who also worked on that game, The Stanley Parable. Yep. Uh, the Beginner's Guide is a fantastic game. It's like a 30-minute, maybe an hour-long little like narrative run-through of... It's like a story, you know? It's a video game with a story in it, which is really strange, because usually they don't have those. Uh, it, it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a story told through interactive video games. The idea is it's this guy, Davey Reedon, who meets this video game designer, like an independent video game designer at an event, who they then strike up a a friendship, and this designer starts sending Davey these games. And Davey is playing through these games and narrating them as he talks over them. And they're weird little, like, Counter-Strike levels with boxes sticking out of buildings and, like, spaceships. Not conventional games in any way, but these really fascinating spaces that this designer put together coda is the name of the designer in the game Hmm. uh yeah everybody check out the beginner's guide if you have some time to spare and you like video games you're still listening to this weird podcast you're still listening to this podcast i would say that uh i would say that the beginner's guide is in an artistic oeuvre with david lynch 
So <laughs> you just you just lost everybody, I think. <laughs> yeah. It's like if David Lynch made a video game. Ooh. Yeah, imagine that everybody. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I can't I I feel like I haven't said a lot of great stuff about Lost Highway, but I really liked it. <laughs> like it's you know, it falls on my my definition of movie, good movie, great movie. Mm-hmm. It falls under good movie. <laughs> it tells a story and it made me ask questions. I think it's a great movie. I didn't really get a lot of answers I wanted, but yeah. you know, I you know, I'm it's tough sometimes because I think I dance on this line between of nihilism. <laughs> I dance on the line of nihilism. I dance on a line of like I like putting the work in. I don't want answers like spoon fed to me. I like listening to an album or a movie and then having to read about it and be like, "Oh, okay." Like a movie should be smarter than me. I think that, and that, not to have any like level of my own intelligence, but just like if I know if I pick up every little thing you did in your movie the first time, I don't think it's you know a movie that's really good because if I notice everything with the first time or without having to hear somebody else analyze it, you know I just it, you lose me. But at the same time, a lot of these uh, a lot of these Lynch movies, I feel like the answers are there, but only because you are allowed to make your own answer. And sometimes I don't... That's the case with any piece of art. I don't want... You know, I don't want that. I want a story. <laughs> I want someone to say, this. The what if this thing happened to these people? Then this would happen. Mm. Like, and you know, I think... So I, I go back and forth because I hate movies. Clearly. Like, you know, Fast and the Furious or just garbage summer movie for fun. Like... I don't really like those movies, but then I, you know, I, I apparently have a line the other way where I, sometimes David Lynch is just too far for me. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Fast and the Furious. It's like Fast and Furious has its own unanswerable questions in it, just like any work of art. Or like fucking Transformers has its own unanswerable questions, just like any work of art. It's all, it, any, any movie is a, especially any very popular movie, is a work of art that can be approached from many different angles. Right, you can approach it from the angle that it wants to be viewed at, but you can also kind of take that view and and twist it a little bit and move it to the side, uh, and and you can look at say instead of I'm trying to think of a good example, but I'm not fucking smart enough, so I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> this this would be so much better if I knew. <laughs> if I if if I was smart, this would be you'd be loving this right now. <laughs> if I were smart and charismatic, I would have a great answer. And you would believe it. If I were smart, <laughs> articulate, and charismatic, you would be I, you would be blown away by what I'm saying right now. <laughs> you would be fucking stunned by that. <laughs> you fucking would be science I'm dropping on to you right your now. <laughs> knees in praise of my intellect. If I were smart, articulate, charismatic, and funny, you would be loving this. There is that self-deprecating humor <laughs> that I love right there. <laughs> if, but, only, if I were all these things, all I right, would be what, good. What do I... What, I'm trying to think of a good example. You can you can watch Transformers and you can look at it the way it wants to be looked at, which is like a gung-ho adventure. Let's all look at how things should be. I've got some ideas about how problems can be solved in the world. Or you can look at Transformers as a piece of propaganda, right? Mm-hmm. You can you can turn it a little bit. It's not intended as a piece of propaganda, but if you look at it as a piece of propaganda, it does function as propaganda really yeah. well. It's internally consistent as propaganda. And you can look at it from that angle despite it not being intended to be looked at that way. With a David Lynch movie, though, the the hard part is trying to figure out any way, any angle at which these movies were meant to be looked at. Because it doesn't seem like there is one angle at which they are meant to be looked at. And part of the challenge is trying to find the... Sorry. <clears throat> trying to find the angle that you like. Or, alternatively, just enjoying the process of finding different angles to view these movies from. Which is what I've really liked. Is like You hold the object up in front of yourself or between yourself and and another person. And you just say, like, alright, well, what did that mean? What did I feel while I was watching that? I thought we got a lot into that on the Eraserhead episode. It's like there's there are so many ways to look at that movie as like a parable about fatherhood, about sure. manhood, about sex, about just the cinematography, you know. And, but that the and I'm glad Eraserhead was something I was thinking of too, and that's kind of the big difference for me is that 
you can you can still look at a racer head at its face and be like this stuff might not make any sense but this is what happens this is what it's about this mm-hmm. is this happens and then this happens and then this happens and that might not make sense to you but yeah there's a man in the sky man, that's it there's a man and, in the planet man in the planet and with this like a racer head you can say well does it mean this does it mean this you can do that with lost highway but at least I think Eraserhead had those things there. You know, just like Transformers, it's very accessible as to say, this is what we're trying to tell you, but you can look at it this way. Mm. And I think that Lost Highway is just gives you many of like, look at all the different ways you can look at this, but you're you have a piece of paper in front of the right directly in front of it, but you can look at all around it, but you're incapable of looking directly at it because they don't you know there's no i like that solid answer that's here. what i like see that's, that's i like that shit that's I like, great if a that, movie, I think if a movie finally... is gonna have if a movie is gonna have any piece missing i want it to be the easily accessible interpretation at 58 i think 58 minutes we finally just boiled <laughs> i understand now we're on yeah okay and i completely this, understand this how you're looking now. at it and this is all right. I'm so glad we watched all these David Lynch movies, <laughs> and I'm so excited to watch more of them. I am so excited to just, um, we're just, I mean, we talked about what we're going to do after this. We're just going to watch... Boondock Saints. Some, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, I, I don't mean to say bad... Oh, speaking of movies that function as propaganda... <laughs> I don't want to say bad movies or albums or anything, because we only talk about things if they're worth talking about, mm-hmm. but... Compared to some of these Lynch movies, we are going to be watching some straight up trash <laughs> afterward, and I am so excited. Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm I'm into it. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna ride this one shot thing into the ground for a little while before we do our next big series. Mm. Which, no spoilers, we decided. Pretty yep. excited for it. Yeah, me too. But anyway. Lost Highway. I do feel like we have come to terms with each other about Lost Highway. Yeah. By now. Though. And David Lynch. That really kind of... Doesn't... Does that... That last conversation really kind of just shifted a few things into place, I think, for both of us. Well, it's... I... Do you enjoy dream interpretation? No. See, maybe that's the other difference, is I do. Yeah. And a, a dream is a classic example of something that if you look at it head on, it makes no fucking sense, right? There's no satisfaction from the story in a dream. But if you look at it from all these different angles, uh, from like a an, in, an inquisitory point of view, to say like, all right, let's instead of instead of approaching the dream with a challenge as like, what does this mean? Approach the dream as though it is definitely meaningful, and what you're trying to do is figure out what it could mean. I, I find that to be a much uh, a much more interesting way of approaching dream interpretation, and that's also the angle from which I approach David Lynch movies. It's like the game is the interpretation. Can I tell you about one of the scariest dreams I ever had? Yes. I was in college. This is not the dream. I was in college when I had the dream. (laughs) I dreamt that I was wandering around a mall parking lot, pushing a shopping cart, and the sky was completely red, and it was like an apocalypse dream. And I was screaming my own name and then I started crying when I realized my name didn't matter because there was no one to shout back to me. (laughs) (laughs) I was like 20 when I had that dream. That's incredible. (laughs) That's a great dream. It It must have been horrifying. It didn't fucking feel great when I woke up. Oh my that god. Is, that's so pure. What do you think that dream means? <laughs> Who the fuck knows? I have... Uh, I mean, I've got some ideas. I wish I were more into dream interpretation because I've had like a series of recurring dreams like my whole life, yeah. usually involving drowning. Or, yeah? You know. Are yeah. they... What are the commonalities between the reoccurrences? Always water. And so, uh, well, you know what? Fuck it. We're, we're going to dream interpretation real quick. Yep. You can be my dream psychologist. All I right. am not a licensed psychologist. <laughs> I am complete amateur. All of this is speculation. Don't dream number one. Uh huh. I'm walking along a frozen body of water, water with my grandmother. I f- break through the ice and I fall. And I look up and I'm drowning as I see my grandmother pounding through the ice trying to... Wow. Break it and How save old were me. you at this? I've had having that. that dream since I was a little kid. Wow. Uh, 
other recurring dream. About drowning? Yeah. I'm in a pond. There's a big pond or lake with a giant white statue of a swan in the middle of it. Mm Mm-hmm. And I swim out to it, and when I get to it, I realize I can't stay there, and I'm too tired to make it back, and I will drown when I swim away from it. That swan is a really interesting image. <laughs> yeah, especially because I like I don't know. I was very young when I also started having that one, and I can't think of any way a swan was significant huh. to me in any. Do you have any associations with the swan? Like zero. If you think about <laughs> if you think about the swan, what else does it make you think of? Literally nothing. Just nothing. Nothing. <laughs> uh, what else? Um, Do you have positive associations with the swan or negative? None. Just oh, none. Like the... if you imagine it and can you picture it in your head right now? Yeah, yeah. Does it make you feel good or bad to think about it? Well, I. It's more like a a hopelessness, like a like a curiosity, like I have to swim out to it. Mm-hmm. But then when I get there, I know that I won't make it back. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then, it sounds like overall a bad dream. Yeah, not not a good dream. <laughs> yeah. uh, the last one is walking along a wooden long wooden pier mm-hmm. that is rotting and falling apart. And there are definitely I, don't, I think when I was a kid there were literally alligators, but as I got older they just started to be this like. There's something bad down there. It's like but... the it's the dragon, right? It's yeah, the, it's the reptilian presence that makes us all scared. Yeah. So I dream about drowning a lot. Yeah. And well, being... that, I mean, that last one does it doesn't really sound like a drowning dream. Yeah. Yeah. But it it, it does it is interesting that the symbolically speaking, <laughs> the great dragon of chaos would be associated with water because water is chaos and drowning means being submerged in chaos and and the dragon is something that pulls you into the chaos so that you will die right because yeah. you can't control chaos. you are an ordered being and if you encounter chaos in its pure form you're fucked basically right um what what do you think would happen if you went down and confronted the alligators oh that's happened yeah i've been being eaten and when it didn't hurt i realized it was a dream and i woke up oh wow yeah huh <laughs> have you ever tried lucid dreaming I tried it. Well, I used to have sleep paralysis a little bit where I would, but not in a scary way. Just it was, it was never frightening to me. So I don't know if it was true sleep paralysis, but I would wake up in my head with my eyes still closed and I couldn't move. Yeah. That's sleep paralysis. And then I kind of, I never felt scared. And then it's good that you didn't have like the crazy nightmare, the demon nightmare that people have sometimes with sleep paralysis. Yeah. That never happened. Usually it just, uh, I'll do like a kill bill and I'll be like, shit, I can't wake up. And then I'll just like wiggle my toe and then <laughs> you'll dream about your vengeance. That if, you... <laughs> I can, if I can get like my, my, finger or my toe to move you watch an anime in your head i can i would never do that (laughs) yeah i don't know those are some tight dreams (laughs) wish they'd go away (laughs) do you still have them regularly i don't dream much anymore when i do have dreams they're like ridiculously scary and vivid dreams i have i also have dreams about like alien abduction yeah but that's only because I am flat out terrified of the existence of aliens. As you should be. Right? Thank you. Aliens are demons, man. They're real, by yeah. the way. They're real and demons are real and they're all out to get us. I think I mean everything is, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. We won't get into alien dreams, but maybe sometime I'll tell you about the the two scariest alien dream type things oh, I've had. But anyway, you know what? This was uh, like a couple years ago at Feast. Everybody was like partying. Feast is a giant party. I'm sure everyone that listens to this knows that. (laughs) You and I were there and uh, we were just like talking about scary stuff and bad dreams and it was way more fun than (laughs) the giant giant rager in the woods. Yeah, this was my first Feast. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I was probably going to cut all this out or none of it because I don't feel like it. (laughs) This is good. Dreamcast. Dreamcast. Hey. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's a thing. I did that on purpose. Oh, I didn't. it took me a second. <laughs> took me a second to get there. It's all good. Well, anyway. That mall parking lot dream, though. That was pretty fucked up, right? It's tight. <laughs> all consistent dreams about drowning my entire life and weird dreams about being abducted by aliens. Mm-hmm. Do not hold a candle. And that's the scariest dream. <laughs> that Realizing was, that there is no one to that, yell your my name, name back. My name didn't at you. matter anymore yeah. because there was no one to yell it and back. And you had this in college? Yeah. That's intense. That was fucked. It was a very dusty dream. It was it, like a dusty. very Yeah. What mall was it? 
Was it the Auburn Mall? I don't. I don't know. I'm picturing the Auburn Mall in my head. I mean, that's head a, because that's it a sounds good... like an experience <laughs> that you could have. It like you're Still... walking through the Auburn Mall, <laughs> yelling your name, and realizing there's no one to hear it. It was. De- I don't know why I was pushing the shopping cart, but it, I was definitely outside in the. Was there anything in the shopping cart? There was like just stuff. Like it wasn't like anything significant, and but it like, wasn't empty. Did it? It seem, just had stuff. Did in it, it seem valuable or? It was just stuff. Just random shit. <laughs> yeah. Did you feel homeless? Because you're painting kind of a homeless <laughs> picture right now. It was actually a premonition for my... Were you playing a lot of Fallout at the time, by any chance? I mean, I've always played <laughs> Fallout, so... Yeah, well, I don't it. know, was New Vegas out at the time? If yes, then yes. <laughs> Even Fallout 3. Before New Vegas, I thought Fallout 3 was, like, the greatest game. Yeah, yeah. Until I learned that it could be better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wish I had dreams like that. Man, it's not as awesome as it might sound. (laughs) It's like watching a movie versus actually experiencing what happens to those characters. Not always great. Careful what you wish for. (laughs) Saw's an okay movie. Wouldn't want to do that in real life. (laughs) Oh, true. That was just an example. Saw's not an okay movie. Saw is a good movie. The first one, here's the thing. The first one is pretty cool, but the other ones are so bad and such a rip-off of the first one that it mm-hmm. takes the value away from Some the first real one. real diminishing returns with that Saw franchise. Yep. Anyway. All right. How long have we been going? A little over an hour. Yeah? We can wrap this up. All right. They've been short lately, but that's, I think, just because we haven't had a... Well, I mean, but... we meant we mean to keep them around an hour now. For yeah, the... yeah. That's yeah. I think that's a good... That's what I like. Yeah, me too. All right. So, next week, we're going to be talking about The Straight Story. Any expectations for that? I think it's going to be a bit of a tonal turner. It's a G-rated <laughs> David Lynch movie. Yeah. Right? So, I think it's going to be pretty different from Lost Highway and Blue Velvet. So, here's here's my here's my predictions, and then I have a quick little piece of funniness about this movie. Mm-hmm. I believe it is called The Straight Story because the guy that... This is based on a true story, and yep. the guy's last name is Straight. Yep. I like to think that it's going to be a play on words and that this is a G-rated Disney movie and for the first time David Lynch has just given you a straight he's story. Just he's just straight he's story. just giving you a movie. I do think that that is part of the I'm wondering if it's going to feel like a David Lynch movie. If he can shut off the part of his brain that makes the weird fucking David Lynch movies. If he can shut off the part of his brain where the eraser head baby just lives and <laughs> yeah. is always there, like, talking like, to him. Yeah, I, I wonder... Make Willem Dafoe do this to Laura Dern. Is it going to feel surreal? Yeah. Will it be the first surreal Disney movie? Right, it's like if... I mean, there are some surreal... There are some parts of Pinocchio that are fucking crazy. Dude, fuck Pinocchio. It's a good movie. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um... I, I, I'm wondering the same thing about the straight story. It's like, is it going to feel like a David Lynch movie? And if so, in what ways is it going to feel like a David Lynch movie? Yeah. Like, we're, we're doing a tour of most of the feature films that David Lynch has made. We're skipping all the short films and the more <laughs> the, experimental, the shorter twi- stuff the that Twin he does. Peaks, uh, we're skipping movie. the entire <laughs> Twin Peaks series and movie. Um, though I hear Fire Walk With Me is really good. I hear that it bombed commercially and critically. Yeah, Wild at Heart and uh, and Fire Walk With Me both had real bad reception. Yeah. Uh, so, I think I may have only done it with Blue Velvet, but I know on Blue Velvet I, I read part of the case. Part what of the, the DVD case, oh, and yeah. I like read the part of the synopsis. Something jumped out at me because I bought the straight story on DVD. On the back of it, the little tagline that we were joking around <laughs> yeah. about says, "The sweetest and most compassionate movie Lynch has ever made." What does that <laughs> even mean? Like in comparison to what? Yeah, like that's not like. Like, so that would make sense. Like, that's not what he does. It's so fucking weird that they would say that. Like, if This you is see... somehow sweeter and more compassionate than <laughs> Blue Velvet. When the new, like, Quentin Tarantino movie comes out, if it's, like, the bloodiest and most revenge-driven uh. movie Tarantino's done yet, you're like, like, oh, that, sick, that's okay. a good thing. That makes sense. Because that's what we go to his movies uh-huh. to see. And then this is literally just like, this is the sweetest movie David Lynch has ever made. That's not why we go here. All right, so it's sweeter than sexual assault? <laughs> good. Oh, good. It's it's cool. sweeter than the, the murder and lustful, <laughs> just under sexy underground of yeah. all these movies. Yep. It's sweeter well, than a man's head being cut in half by a table? 
that's good, good. I guess. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is such a fucking weird thing to say about it. Like, I think maybe everybody must have just been like, what the fuck is huh. David Lynch doing directing a Disney movie? I didn't really know until we started the series that this movie existed. I didn't either. Do you know, uh, do you know why he directed this movie? No, I don't. Uh, it's as simple, fucking David Lynch, mm-hmm. it's as simple as, it was the next script I fell in love with. Yep. Just fucking, something about it spoke Dave, to him. David Lynch goes through, David Lynch follows his heart. Yep. All right? As he should. Yeah. So that's I, next I, week. You know what? I I feel like if I was David Lynch and I had an idea that people had built up an expectation of what to expect from my movies, I would be looking for a straight story to tell. <laughs> I would be out for blood uh, just looking for a G-rated script to direct. I was going to say, I think like the pessimistic you know, part of my brain is just like David Lynch needed to cash some fucking checks <laughs> after Wild at Heart and uh, the and Twin Lost, Peaks movie and, yeah. and Lost, uh, Lost Highway. I keep wanting to say Lost Valley. Yeah, no. It's not that. <laughs> you want to so, play some paintball? <laughs> obviously. Um, yeah, so that's next week. And uh, then after that, there's Mulholland Drive. After that, Mulholland Drive, which by many accounts is David Lynch's masterpiece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If I believe, at least according to Roger Ebert, it's... Uh, For Roger Ebert, it was like the first good movie Lynch yeah, made. Yeah, it's you, you have your... And it's not... Like, Roger Ebert does recognize that David Lynch is a good director. It's more that Roger Ebert, in his reviews of Lynch's movies up to Mulholland Drive, seems to think that David Lynch makes evil movies. <laughs> like, it's not that his movies are bad as movies, it's that they're bad as culture. Like, they're actively detrimental to the project of culture. I haven't looked at his reviews as much as you have, but I think uh, it might have been on on his review of Wild at Heart. I think that the big criticism of at least that one is that, like, I think he was under the impression that David Lynch was still trying to like, like if he could just get out of his own fucking way, he mm-hmm. could make his next eraser head. Like yeah. that was, he's just doing, he's cramming too much or trying to be so abstract. Maybe that's me just putting words in Roger Ebert's mouth, mm-hmm. but it seemed that he was thinking that he was trying to be so artistic that he was lacking just the, the core of a basic good movie. It's uh, it, my impression of Roger Ebert's opinion of, David Lynch, fascinating stuff here, right? Everyone comes <laughs> to this podcast to hear my interpretations of Roger Ebert's criticism of, of filmmakers. <laughs> my interpretation of Roger Ebert's uh, of statements about David Lynch is that uh, is that David Lynch always has a patina of irony about his work that makes it um, that that undercuts him when he tries to approach serious subject matter. That's Roger Ebert's opinion. I don't agree with that. I think that the I, I think David Lynch is a much less ironic filmmaker than a lot of people try to make him out to be. And that when you take away the possibility of interpreting his movies, ironically, they become a lot scarier. And I do think that that's what David Lynch is trying to do with a lot of his movies. I think perhaps David Lynch is a man who is deeply unsettled by the state of the world, not like politically, but ethically and spiritually. I would agree with that. And, uh, and that his movies are a way of, uh, of depicting some of the ways in which the world is fallen. I I think that still, from where we are in his filmography, I still think that David Lynch doesn't even really care about being a filmmaker. It's just, <laughs> this is the best way he's found to get these ideas and questions about life yeah, it's like made people, into a physical media. Maybe at some point he just recognized, like, I can get funding for a movie, yeah. you know, like, and I kind of have an idea for one. Yeah, me and, and Barry want to make another movie together, so let's... It makes me wonder how Eraserhead happened. It's It feels like we're light years away just from you know, David, David Lynch's uh, head in Eraserhead, mm-hmm. just... That's so weird to see the even like these movies just feel so different. I guess no movie feels like a racer head, so what do you expect? Yeah. But I don't know. Anyway, that's next week. Straight um, story. Yeah, and then Mulholland Drive, and then we are slowly piecing together what our wrap up episode for the yep. David Lynch series is gonna be. I think we have a couple couple things planned. Mm-hmm. So we'll that'll be the next few weeks. And then come April 
<laughs> Get that Boondock Saints, baby. That's the we'll keep the rest Boy. of it. We'll keep the rest of it hidden, but you can Boy. rest assured. Yeah. We're gonna do a two part series about <laughs> <laughs> that was my stipulation. <laughs> we have to spend a whole episode on each movie. Curtis insists that we <laughs> that we dedicate an entire episode to the garbage fire that is Boondock Saints part two. Oh, I hope. Thanks, you, Troy. I hope you love the first. You think one. we can get Troy Duffy on this podcast? Well, I know he listens to the show, <laughs> he's so a big listener. Yeah, he's a he's a big fan. Yeah. Um. So we could probably do that. Yeah, I think we could get him yeah. on here. We might even be able to. Uh, we could uh, co-direct one of the episodes of Boondock Saints that. He's... Sorry, what? <laughs> there, I, at some point after the second one, I think, or maybe it was after the first one. At some point, they were trying to get a series, like a TV series, off the ground, uh, but it, you know, it just never happened. It must have been before the second movie. That mm-hmm. wouldn't make any sense after the first, after the second one. I don't think it would have made any sense after the first one. Well, the first one, you know, well, first one made a big splash. All right, we'll I talk can't, about it. We'll talk we'll, about we'll it. We'll get there. We'll get. We'll get there. there. All right. Um, Give the spiel. Is that it? Is that everything? I think I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much, I gotta get home. We've hang exhausted out with my each baby other. before it's dark and snowy. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you guys should uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at KurtCake5K. You should listen to Black Gold Podcast and Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts by subscribing to Black Gold Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. Get those discussions going. You can follow Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts at Ben underscore and underscore Kurt on Twitter. And I think that is about it. So we will be back next week to talk about the straight story. And uh, we'll be one step closer to finishing this David Lynch series, baby. That's... <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll enjoy another great David Lynch movie. <laughs> Have a wonderful week, everybody. Yeah.